the stream is in fact unmuted and we are recording and we're starting now welcome back guys this is now week what 12 11 we're getting close to the end of the semester it's the last week of actual education reading negative one as max says all right okay we're starting now announcements join the discord I would like to thank you guys in the Discord, but I join the Discord swag. So you can sign in. Is signing up? Okay, sign in's coming up real soon. Please sign in. That's how you become a real member, and you can vote in our elections that are coming up. Oh, yeah, swag. Check the calendar. The elections will be on the calendar in addition to all the events that may or may not be happening because at the end of the semester. Woo! -hoo. Also, join the mailing list. I think we have, we, we still send out mail, mails, emails, right? At the end of the semester? Yeah, the newsletters. End of the semester newsletters, dude. Oh, yeah. Meet the sponsors. Okay, come on. Come on. We're clapping. Keep clapping, please. Swag, swag, swag. Follow our social media. Um, Sophia's been doing a great job. There is a recent ISTS post. I think that was the week before last or something like that. You should go like that and repost it and comment sweet, sweet things under it. Okay. So as this week is the last week of actual education, I have uh, Mr. Max... Let's go. Presenting on containerization and Kubernetes. There'll be a sweet demo too. Oh, you with the little mic thing thing? I don't know about that. I think we kind of abolished that, but uh, okay. Max is pulling one. Does that work? My hands are real warm. Okay, swag. Bye, guys. Testing. There we go. Test, test. Okay, it looks good. Okay. Uh, as you guys probably imagine, this is the first time that we're actually doing containerization in Kubernetes. It's going to be a new topic. Uh, I hope this carries through to following semesters, but I felt this was something that was kind of lacking from our education and something that's becoming larger and larger in the security community. So first off, let's talk about who I am. Probably know a lot of that. Uh, one special thing up there, this is officially my 25th RITSEC presentation. So I'm very excited for that. But yeah, uh, we're going to be going over a bunch of stuff. First off, what is containerization? Um, a lot of people uh, hear the term, a uh, difference between uh, virtualization and containerization specifically. We'll be talking about it in a second. But containerization is generally the process of packaging applications and their dependencies into portable, self-sufficient units called containers. Okay, so now you have an application that is infinitely distributable, uh, scalable, it's isolated, lightweight. So all these different benefits come with containerization. So uh, we first need to start off understanding what the difference between containerization and virtualization is. Most of you are probably thinking, if you don't necessarily know the difference yet, well, both are running in secure environments and we're purposely segmenting them from the network. Well, yeah, isolation comes with both of these, but different levels of isolation at that. So uh, first to understand, containerization, containers are not full operating systems. They uh, use the host kernel and I, I always like to think about it is you're building a container around a process. And your host operating system is still running that process, but within that process it can branch out, become its like own environment. But it's ultimately still your computer maintaining all the resource or uh, maintaining all the specific resources for that. Uh, we run it runs off some kind of containerization engine, or sometimes actually kind of not. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in a second but we need some kind of underlying technology in order to build this. Um, 
And most importantly, you should be, but you can use it for multiple. This containers, the specifically securely way, secure way to do it is you should be using it for single applications. Purposely limiting what is in your environment so that there's no, uh, no ability to pivot or at least not easily pivot uh, if it were to be broken. Uh, and then most importantly, it's got a small overhead. You're building a, a, ra or a container around a process instead of virtualization, we'll be talking about we're building an entire well, operating system in an operating system. You're running your own kernel, and moving into that, it's a full operating system virtual machines. They run off some kind of hypervisor, whether that be, uh, if you remember from your, I, I forget what class it is at this point, but there's uh, a bare metal hypervisors, and then there's host, host hypervisors, and it's basically where it's running. And this is used for a single operating system, so there's many different things that will ho happen in that VM, or at least should. You shouldn't be running a single application off of, of, off a virtual machine. And with this comes a very large overhead as you're virtualizing your entire kernel, or an entire kernel. So uh, looking at the different containerization engines, uh, the pretty much what everything based, is based on is Containerd. You may have heard this, you may have not. A lot of people will think Docker. Docker is the one that uh, started everything and everything is based on, but no, it's actually a child of Containerd. Uh, so Docker, of course, is, as you probably all imagine, is the industry standard. Uh, pretty much everyone uses it for uh, general purpose containerization, and it's uh, daemon-based. Podman, uh, Malik, uh, very sweet man, he, uh, he actually did a presentation on Podman, and it works essentially like Docker, but without a daemon. So uh, with that comes, uh, instead of having a daemon that's running out of root that's controlling all your containers, you can actually independently uh, containerize a single process instead of having a daemon uh, do all that containerization and management. So a little bit more intensive, but it's got different uh, factors that go into it. There's LXC slash LXD. This is operating system level containers. A uh, very cool project. They've actually, it, it run, if, as, if what I saw is correct, it actually runs as pretty much your operating system and so you can run uh, containers on your pretty much almost like a bare metal level. So it's running as like a type one hypervisor that's able to maintain containers. And so you're able to just like, uh, your actual host environment might be an actual uh, just VM that you spin up. Next is uh, Kubernetes. This is the big one that's been coming out and will be a decent amount of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, high scalability and deployable containers, and I'd just like to say, there's way, way more than this. There are so many different containerization engines. Um, just feel free to look them, out, look them up. If there's a specific feature you want, it's probably already built, and if it's not built, build one. So uh, we're gonna move, be moving immediately into uh, Docker. And a lot of what can be said for Docker can be said for a lot of other things. Uh, even though that uh, a Docker Docker ultimately creates a Docker container. You can still use that same exact image to build a Podman container or uh, deploy that container inside of Kubernetes. This is just like the baseline in order to uh, build what you're gonna be containerizing. And it's transferable against, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much sure every single uh, containerization engine because they all rely on container D to build these. So first off is your Docker fire. Docker file. This is used to build your image. Imagine this as you just describing what your container is going to be. Uh, it's just a giant list of actions to run, things to include, such and so forth. And yeah, it describes how our images are going to be built. Images, uh, these are your compiled Docker files. These are built to be shipped. When you're transferring a Docker, uh, a Docker container, you're not transferring the actual running container. You're, transfer you're transferring a single state of that container the beginning state, and that's what an image is. It's your base state of an instance, and whenever it needs to be reset, it resets to that, uh, uh, which we call level. And then lastly is a Docker container. This is the actual running Docker image. So when you start it up, it will have uh, some kind of, it will have a designated uh, entry point that will run some kind of executable, start your, uh, which we call it, and it will start your container. 
So you see just a general flow, flow chart of you build your Docker file to create an image, and then you run your image to create a, uh, create a container. Okay, so that's all good and, uh, good and well. Uh, what the hell is a Docker file? Well, uh, first thing you need to understand is all the important directives. So uh, when you're starting a Docker file, it's very specific. You have to name it Docker file, capital D. Ran into this issue a lot. Um, but there are ways to get around that if you don't want to call it Docker file. It's a little bit extra finagling that you don't have, you shouldn't really have to deal with. But yeah, so we're describing how the Docker image has to be built. So in every single uh, Docker file, you have to have a from directive. This is saying, hey, where are we, what's the base image that we're building on? Because that's the thing with Docker, uh, it's all iterative. So when you're saying, oh, from Ubuntu, well, what's Ubuntu? Ubuntu is another, uh, another Docker image that you're just building on top of, and you can overwrite stuff, you can add stuff. So yeah, build is always what you have, to, or from is always what you have to start with. Next, run. This runs a command. Uh, so when you're actually compiling your uh, container, what it's essentially doing is every single time it sees something, uh, it's a live environment, it builds it all, it takes that step, uh, pretty much just like, or creates a state of it and stores it. So when we're running command in the container, it's actually a live environment that it's running, uh, doing whatever it needs, and then once it's done, it stores it. Uh, same with copying files and adding files. These are pretty much the exact same thing, but add has the, or copy has the ability to, um, oh, sorry, add has the ability to handle tarballs and URLs. So you can tar an entire, uh, say, set of binaries, and you just add them all to your binaries file, and add will automatically untar them, take them down, or you have some kind of uh, URL to host them. And then lastly, these are what we talked about as our entry point, CMD, or, well, entry point. So the difference here is that CMD, uh, it's a default uh, to run a container. Uh, entry point's the same exact way, but it, entry point is meant to be used as an executable. So instead, so as much as you can have binaries, you can also have containerized binaries. So say it doesn't have to interact with your host system at all, and you just need to run something, and you want to make sure that it doesn't interact, you can run pretty much uh, a, Docker, a Docker image as just a single executable. And there's a bunch of caveats to that. And this may look complicated, but it's all just, uh, this is a Docker file, I, I forget for what, but we can see all the different things. There's stuff like environment, which we're setting environment variables. Um, Workdir, we're setting our working directory. It's all very understandable, and once you see it, you can uh, begin to understand. So one of the things that I never kind of understood when I started, uh, we're taking her off. Siri wants to be vocal today. Um, so where are images actually from? You said, Max, before every single image comes from something else, well, where does it start? Well, funny enough, it comes from scratch. That's actually the base image uh, for all Docker containers. This is just a, a base, container, base container image, contains pretty much nothing. And even if you look at, uh, right here is a little snippet from the Hello World container. All it does is, it says from scratch, you copy over a binary, and when you start, you're on the binary. It says hello world. Cool. But what's the rest of this? Um, so we said all Docker files need to have a from directive. Uh, these from directives can be a little bit different depending on what you're doing. It, doing. Images are usually named using an image name colon tag. Your base tag is going to be latest. So anytime you push without a tag, that will be your latest. Or I think even with a tag, that will also be your latest. Uh, it just ensures that if you're saying nothing, it will always pull the latest and most secure version, or really just latest, and it assumes to be the most secure version. Um, using from directive will automatically pull from hub.docker.com, but you can also pull from uh, other container registries uh, just by uh, putting your registry URL and then slash the image name. So anything, I forget, there's, um, there's a bunch of container registries that you can use. Uh, I, I always forget them. I think even at this point, uh, GitHub, you're actually able to use as a container registry. But yeah, so that's a, that's a bunch of stuff. Next, 
uh, with the from directive, a lot of people don't know this, and I actually didn't know this until someone showed me it, and I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Multi-stage builds. So what happens when you need a container that may uh, have to pull from two separate containers? Like, um, I don't know, you're building something in Golang, but you want to run it in Alpine. But you don't want all the Go binaries on Alpine itself. And you don't want to have to go through the process of deleting everything. So uh, Docker files allow for multi-stage builds. So only one image is built, that's your final image, and, but multiple images can be made. So you use uh, from as directives. Um, actually, surprisingly, this doesn't use it. Uh, it's actually instead, uh, you can either name it, so like uh, from Golang as, say, builder, and then you can copy from, at, uh, from builder, or you can actually uh, name them based on the order that they came in. So this was the first one, so it would be zero. So you're copying from zero. Um, so we see up there, uh, from node 16 as build. And then the contents of the staging containers uh, can be moved between the containers. So uh, here, we're gonna be compiling the application, and then here we're gonna be uh, moving it over and running that application. So again, that copy, tech tech from build, and then we can move it between containers. Yeah, and as we talked about, they can be indexed, so from equals zero. Um, the other thing, I know there's a lot of uh, specifics about building containers, but this is really everything that you need to know about a container. And the majority of it, to make it secure, is you have to know how to build them, how to understand how they're built. So images are like ogres, they have layers. So if you ever, um, if you ever pull an image and you see all this stuff and it's like, why are all those hashes and why are they downloading all at the same time and why do I need all this? Why isn't this just a single container? This is actually an optimization built by uh, Docker itself. It kind of works like Git. So uh, every single time you have a directive like run or copy, it gets stored as a layer. We use that terminology before, call it, call it even like a commit. So uh, yeah, images uh, are, sto are stored and built in as images to speed up uh, building and downloading. So say that you notice that you mistype something uh, 50 lines down in a Docker file and it already took you like an hour to get there. Well, you can just change that 50th line to fix it and it will start at the 50th line because it saw that you uh, already stored all these layers. They all worked correctly, so why do you have to rebuild it? You can rebuild it if you want. And then likewise, for downloading, well, we can download multiple at the same time. That speeds up our efficiency uh, really well. And uh, as a best practice, you wanna make sure that if you're, if you're deploying something really serious, you wanna make sure that there's as little layers as possible. Even in, you see like, if you actually look at the, uh, the what you call it, the Docker file for Ubuntu itself, it is literally one tarball that they add and they say, cool, that's it, that's Ubuntu. Cool. So why exactly is that? So we have an example Docker file here. Um, we're from Ubuntu. Uh, we're copying secret into slash secret. We're reading the secret and then we're removing the secret. Okay, that should be secure. We removed what we used. Well, no, because everything's stored in layers. So we can see uh, that dark comparison that we're going from here. We have, four, we have four layers, or we have four directives, and we can actually see one out of four, two out of four, three out of four, four out of four. We can see all these layers being built. Okay, cool. Uh, so how do we actually do it? So as we said, uh, I've been talking about tar a lot. Every single one of these layers um, a Docker container just becomes a big tarball. And then within that, there's directories for each of those that contain a layer.tar. So uh, this is actually a really cool application called Dive, where you can just say, hey, can you, get, uh, can you take this uh, Docker image and break it apart? And it'll go layer by layer, show you that uh, in this layer, secret.txt got added. And then if you move one down, it'll also say it gets removed. And then you can go back Using that hash that you found uh, for the ID of the layer, you move into that, you, uh, you, tar the, or you extract the layer, and then you can cap the secret, and you can instantly see what that secret is, even though it doesn't exist in the actual container or the image if you say to run it. Okay, so we talked about uh, all the build. So how do we actually deploy? How do we uh, move forward? So there's a lot of ways in Docker to run it. I personally like Docker Compose 
because you don't have to remember any commands. And then likewise, once you have a Docker Compose working, to fix it, you only have to edit a couple words instead of retyping an entire command, and then you have to remember that command. So Docker Compose, you name a file Docker, uh, Docker attack compose.yaml, can be with an A or without an A for YAML. Um, this simplifies the building and run, running of images into a single step. Uh, there's four main components. There's actually a couple more, but you'll never use them. There's technically a config uh, portion that really no one ever uses. But first, version. You're describing what version of Docker, the, what you call it, the YAML, the YAML Docker Compose spec you want to be using. Okay, cool. Uh, services. What are you actually running? Uh, what what containers are you running? How are they running? Uh, do you want to add anything at, to them at runtime? Uh, networks. So this defines the networks themselves. So at, from base, uh, Docker images will just be put on their own sep or, uh, segmented networks. Or sorry, there's actually one base Docker network that everything gets put on. Uh, there can be communication between them. But if you say want to segment them onto their own networks, or have some on a back end and some on a front end, or even have some that both have access to a front end and back end network, you can define networks. So that you can uh, then say this container is on uh, back end and front end, this container is on front end. And then very similarly, volumes. Um, we can, uh, Docker volumes are pretty much just block storage that we can define and uh, add, at start, it's empty, but this can persist over time, and we can always mount it to the same location, uh, so that the Docker, so that your containers can use them. And then running, and then running these are very simple: Docker compose up, Docker compose down, and just like that, you have uh, what call it. You can run it an entire set of services with a single command, and also your entire schema for whatever you're running already documented. You can see a bunch of stuff where uh, if you're defining a service, use image if uh, you're going to be pulling from something that already exists, and, and it relies on that same thing. Likewise, you can also use the build. You can also use build in order to build from a Docker file. So this is just able to squash everything that Docker does into something that's very easily digestible. So um, let's talk a little bit more about low-level containerization. This is a security talk, so there should be some security stuff in it. Um, so there's a couple of key features that make uh, containers secure. So I, I, I'd like to say that Docker containers are secure by default, and uh, that's somewhat true. You, of course, can mess it up, but that's your own fault. And then there's like what, likewise also zero days that can happen. But for the most part, you build the container in Docker, and unless there's some uh, serious misconfiguration you do, or a zero day, you're pretty much set. Um, so first thing that Docker does is namespace segmentation. Um, if you actually ever look into proc on a single, uh, what you call it, uh, on a single uh, process, there's actually uh, an S folder. Or I, I forget exactly what it is. This defines the namespace of it, and this can just be your own, uh, your own, or you can segment it into something else. Your entire operating system kind of relies on this namespace architecture so that you can know what resources you see or you can segment into a different. So, uh, so we create separate namespaces uh, for a bunch of system resources like PID, uh, so PID, your processes, net, your network, uh, MNT, your mounts, a bunch of other stuff. But basically it says Docker containers by default can't see these other things. There's, I think there's more, but Generally, those are the base ones. Control groups, C groups. So this is your ability to enforce resource limits. And you can actually do this in Linux itself. It's a little bit more complex. But um, Docker has a pre-built in so that you can say, I only want this uh, container to ever use 250 megabytes of RAM. Cool. You can just write that right in your Docker Compose. There's some configuration for it. And you're set. Uh, OverlayFS. A lot of people actually don't know about OverlayFS, but every single container is actually deployed as uh, an OverlayFS file system. So th this is just like something some specialized for containers themselves, and it's pretty much just some uh, a big Cheroot jail. If you actually ever look in, uh, what is it, proc mounts, and you see that your first line is OverlayFS, 
for the type of file system you're running, you're running on, you can almost guarantee that you're in a container. And then likewise, uh, based on whether that overlay FS is mounted as read, uh, read only or read write, you can actually tell if your container is in a privileged mode or not. Next, transparency mounts. So say you're mounting in, uh, I don't know, like a SQL, uh, a SQL file or a database or whatever it is. Um, it doesn't really help much if you get dropped in a container and you can instantly just look at your mounts and see that, oh, well, uh, there's some like secret information mounted here. Docker has what's called transparent, or container D has what's called transparent mounts. So volumes are uh, mounted, but not shown in proc mounts. They're, in, they're instead uh, completely, uh, that's the wrong word. Uh, they're, you're not able to see the difference between them and just a normal directory. So there's no real way to tell. There's actually, sometimes you can go into that and you can see that that user doesn't exist and it'll actually show a PID if you're on something like LS Tech LA uh, instead of like a username. So there's sometimes that issue. There's a ton more that Docker does. So um, what are some Docker vulnerabilities and misconfigurations that we can get from these? Well, as we said, Docker's kind of secure by default, but escapes, of course, zero day. We're never gonna be completely secure from stuff. Um, there's been vulnerabilities like dirty pipe. Uh, one of my favorite that, it depends on what you're deploying. Some people claim this as a feature uh, and it's necessary for some things like uh, running traffic, but if you include your Docker sock inside of uh, a container, you can theoretically escape, always. Um, and then namespace escapes. So if you're saying uh, mounting a privileged container uh, with, what is it? A privileged container with access to your PID uh, namespace, you can just enter uh, PID one and control that namespace, and now you have a, a shell in the system. There's actually I can never find it. Uh, I, I heard about it at DEF CON, and I haven't I haven't been able to find it since. But there's like low level uh, ways in Linux. As long as you mount a container as privileged, it's like a feature that you can actually do host space or host um, uh, code execution. It's, it, it's something really weird. You have to like make some like special directory and stuff. I, I don't necessarily understand it. It's in like, you make a directory in proc and it, it's a bunch of weird stuff. Uh, of course, sensitive data exposure. Say if you're including one of those layers and you accidentally statically include your API key. Well, now they have your API key every time it loads up. Uh, a big thing about Docker is anything sensitive, you wanna do at runtime so that if your container registry or someone just reboots your box and gets another shell, they can't just find uh, sensitive information based on race condition. And then lastly, uh, another thing that people don't realize, block storage mounts. Sometimes people will actually mount their block storage devices inside a container, and it gives you direct access to the, root fi or the host file system. So, I actually forgot to get up. Um, Let's get code open. Let's hope this is the right directory. It is. Yay. Okay. Um, if it decides to open up, there we go. So we're gonna be doing the container escape one. I'm gonna be, I think this is already released on my GitHub if you want. Um, so container escape. So if we, I can actually just pull it up up here we can talk about the Docker sock, Docker sock escape. So what explicitly is that? We're including our Docker sock, uh, the socket that actually like, controls Docker, um, and we're just putting it into our container. Some things like traffic require this, so it's able to maintain other, uh, what is it, other containers. But for us, um, if we do something like, uh, what is it, Docker, Docker run tech IT, and we named it exploit, and we're gonna be running bash. And good thing I wrote down this stuff, bin bash. Yep, we can even see it pulling as layers. Docker has this new fancy thing where it's got like colored check marks and unit code and a bunch of stuff. We're so cool. Um, Wow, that's, that's great that it stopped doing that. Maybe bat, oh, there we go. Okay, so we're actually just in Docker, so we can actually see that, uh, we can see all this. 
Um, and the escape is that we just build a more vulnerable container. So we talked about if we can see like uh, the PID of the host and we're in a privileged container, we can just escape. So what happens, we build that container and then we exec into it. Well now we have a privileged container that we can escape from. So right here we use our little NS enter. So we're entering a namespace. Uh, the target is one, so our, uh, whatever is initializing our file system. So we'll basically run, running as root. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, those are just saying what, um, what should we call it, uh, namespaces to include. We run and we're root on Fedora. That is my laptop. And we actually didn't initially start as running as root. So right there we see a little bit of issue with uh, Docker running as root because we escape from a container and we're instantly root. Cool. So that's uh, that basic escape. Uh, we'll be, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any other escape plans, but uh, this is just a really cool one that can show you from something, some configuration like including your Docker sock. Well, you can then build a, a, a vulnerable container and then escape from that container and then you have root-based privileges on your host. We're gonna move that over so we don't keep going over my Discord and potentially leaking stuff. Okay, cool, Docker's over. Congrats, you guys are now containerization something. Wizards. wizards, containerization wizards. Okay, Kubernetes, the big kahuna as we said. What the hell are they? Well, they're distributed and scalable container display, uh, deploy. What the hell does that mean? I don't know. Um, so here are some general terms that you'll need to know as we talk about this. First are nodes. These are the actual hosts uh, that, they're like worker machines that the, or that the Kubernetes will use to deploy your containers and run your containers. So when we're talking about a distributed and scalable deploy, well, we need to be able to horizontally scale as much as we want. So we need, we're gonna need as many uh, worker nodes as possible to run all those containers. And thus, we have these worker nodes. Control plane. These are just like the set of components managing the state of the cluster. So there's stuff like uh, the API, there's like etcd, etcd mounts, um, secrets, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, this manages what Kubernetes actually is because without it, you just have a bunch of connected computers that with best effort, you can probably do the same thing. So next, pod. We talked about how uh, images or containers are like the base, everything. Well, no, not in Kubernetes. They call it something different. They call it a pod. This, pods are the smallest unit uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, they contain a single instance of a running application or a container, uh, containing one or more, or sorry, containing one or more containers. So you can have a pod that's theoretically running 10 containers, but that single unit, you can then say, I wanna scale this 50 times. And it says, cool, 50, I'll do that. And just like that, you do it. This is, I. I've said this and people are like, that's stupid. And then I always like it as just a way to extend further. I feel like this is the logical extension of Docker Compose. So everything that you can do in Docker Comp or in Kubernetes, you can realistically do on your own laptop besides like the, the scalable deploy across like multiple nodes. There's several ways to do it in Docker Compose, but you don't have the rich API. You don't have uh, all the nicest niceties of Kubernetes. Um, there's, there's, pl there's plenty of ways that you can set up like replica sets in Docker Compose. They don't work very well. They don't work as well as Kubernetes, but you can still do them. So first thing you need to understand with Kubernetes, how the hell do you access it? Uh, I think the first time that I was messing with Kubernetes, I was really confused. I got like a shell on, on one of my nodes and I'm like, okay, now how do I deploy containers? And I messaged someone and they said, are you stupid? And I'm like, I guess. So you gotta think about Kubernetes as an API. Uh, you don't need console access to the nodes. What you need is access to the API which will control all those nodes. So uh, the kubeconfig is a configuration file that formats all your credentials to access a cluster. You can actually see a very basic one up here. It doesn't contain any like, information that's sensitive, um, but you can define all the clusters. Uh, you can have access to all the different contexts, or sorry, that should go down a little bit more. But um, clusters, uh, 
users, and then contexts. So contexts are the actual like accessing. You have to define what kind of cluster, what kind of user, and then you're the name that you want to uh, say that context is. Um, so you can have contexts that are on that use the same user on different. Uh, actually, no, you can't do that. Uh, you can have different contexts that are on the same exact clusters, but that that have different permissions, so that you're only deploying as admin when you actually need it. Um, so you can either place your cube config at a dot cube config, and it will just automatically get recognized. Uh, that is like your bin bash. It'll know exactly when it runs that executable. Hey, I need to do this stuff. And cube config, or dot cube config, that's where it'll automatically look. Binaries like kctl, or I actually call it a bunch of things. Uh, K, kctl, and kubectl, those are all the same exact executables but it's a, a lot easier to write K instead of kubectl every single time you're running something. And then Helm, which we'll also be talking from, we'll pull from, from this configuration file. Likewise, if you don't want it in .cube config for whatever reason, you can just set your uh, environment file kube config to uh, whatever you want for alternate locations. So we talked about this a little bit more, uh, a little bit before. Kubernetes, kube config ha can have multiple contexts, but you can only be running as a single one. Contexts are like your user profile. This is saying, hey, what cluster am I on? What user am I running as? And a bunch of other stuff. So in order to see all the different contexts you have, you do kubectl, config, get contexts. Seems simple enough. A lot of Kubernetes is really English when you break it down. And once you get used to the syntax, it's, you can just kind of guess. Um, and then to use a different context, kubectl, config, use context. And then you supply whatever the context name is. Okay, so we now have access to a cluster and we can see like say pods running or like services running and stuff like that. What are those resources? So there's three main resources that you can have in a cluster. First is a pod. That's your basic unit of whatever container, uh, of like application. That's where you're containerizing everything. You can run bare metal, con or not bare metal, but bare containers in them. Um, how do we group them? Say that we have 50 pods that we all want to be able to load balance across. How do we say this group of things, this is one service? Well, we have services. Uh, services are pod networking and load balancing. We're basically able to group and make logical abstractions about services, or about pods. And lastly, ingress. This is your external access to services. Ingresses are controlled by what's called uh, an ingress controller. We'll be talking about it a little bit more in a second. Um, and there's a final thing you need to understand about Kubernetes. Not the same kind of, or it kind of, from a definition standpoint, it's pretty much the same as what we talked about previously. Kubernetes loves namespaces. So namespaces are just logical abstractions to like group and deploy against. So that you can have an entire, so if you want to deploy, say, your web server in one namespace, and your, I don't know, your website and another one. I, I, those are the same thing somehow. But um, uh, this is just a way to segment resources um, so that when you're deploying something new, you don't see a thousand and a half pods uh, in your current namespace. You can just uh, keep everything as bare as possible, segment everything so that they don't have access to each other. So there's just ways to isolate, res uh, group, organize, and isolate resources in your cluster so that you can just draw imaginary lines that actually work to segment stuff. So in order for to, to create a namespace, again, it's kind of like English. Kubectl, kubectl create namespace and whatever your namespace is. The other one's a little bit different because your namespace is actually handled by your kube config. So if you say kubectl config set context, your current context and your namespace is equal to your namespace, you're able to switch that namespace. Okay. So we talked about uh, pods, services, and ingresses. Let's start at the base, the basis. What is a pod, or how do we deploy a pod? So this is like deploying an actual container, but our pod can have multiple containers within it. Um, spec define, there's, as we go down, every single, uh, deploy will have an API version, a kind, a metadata, and a spec. Spec is how we, def uh, 
define how the pods are deployed. And um, for uh, API version apps slash v1 and then kind deployment, that just basically says we're gonna be running a pod. Pods are also called deployments. I like pod just because it's simpler to explain to everyone. Um, and likewise, um, for our containers, um, we can use spec.template.spec to define how our individual, uh, it should be saying containers are built. Um, no, actually right, that is how pods are built because your spec template spec contains all the different con containers you have. So right here is actually the configuration for an app that I'm running on uh, Kubernetes. Um, the thing you have to understand that kind of becomes a pain if you don't immediately start with it, you have to have all your images in some kind of container registry. Kubernetes does not want to have to build your, uh, build your application every single time that you say do it. So what it's gonna do is just pull from something. Uh, for me, it's a Docker Hub and it's my OTN uh, image. And then there's also stuff like image pull policy. So this basically says anytime it's deployed, should it be pulling from what it did initially or uh, should it be pulling from what's newest? When there's a new update, should it automatically update all the containers? And so this is actually a really cool way of using CI, CD. And so say you uh, redeploy or rebuild a container and set up a new latest in your container registry. Kubernetes can automatically detect that and upgrade everything for you. So that's configuration management on its own. So, or, yeah. Uh, yeah, we talked about this. But there's a lot of words here. A lot of them don't mean anything. It just becomes a template that you have to fill out. Okay, so deploying a service. This is the next abstraction that we need to make. So we're grouping pods for networking. Spec defines how a uh, service is built. Uh, we talked about th that before. Spec.type, that's what kind of service that we're running. There's four main services. There's, you can get like special and there's like some more, I think. Um, so the four main ones are cluster IP. This exposes a pod as an internal IP. So this isn't routable, but it will show you an IP that if you hit that endpoint, it will uh, choose, one of the, choose one of the pods that it has. Node port, it specifically uh, exposes that service as just a port on your cluster. Um, so you actually don't need an ingress for that one. Likewise, for load balance, you also don't need an ingress because it will expose a pod as an external IP. We'll be talking a little bit more about how that works in a second. And lastly, uh, external name. Uh, this will expose pods as a domain name. So these are just like the different ways to expose, um, port or expose some kind of externally routable or internally routable uh, identifier so that we can access the resources inside of a service. Uh, not all deploys will need an ingress, as we talked about. Uh, and the other important thing that you need to understand is that services will need some kind of selector. So with here, we have that our app is gonna be OTN app uh, as our selector. And then if we look for uh, actual deployment, we have that our name is OTN app. So we'll see that, we'll see all the labels match, and from there it can just understand that if it has this uh, name, it runs. And likewise, you can also do that for labels and stuff like that. Lastly, ingresses. These are super customizable, there's a ton. Um, they all kind of follow the same like suit in how they're done, but they have different uh, benefits to how you wanna run them. So uh, spec defines an ingress again, and we're just, we define all the information about it, and then we define the spec that deploys it. Um, so there, it, it kind of depends on what exactly you're defining afterwards based on whatever uh, kind of spec or ingress control or ingress control you're running to match up with that. But um, some of the big ones are like Nginx, HA proxy, traffic, and then there's a bunch more for ingress uh, controllers. And then for advanced configuration, you also have the ability to like path-based routing. So say you wanna run your API on a different server than you wanna run your main website. Well, let's say that the first, uh, first path is slash API. We'll, we'll route it to a different container. Uh, next, fan out. Uh, 
you can route requests to multiple services based on a host. So this is the ability to, uh, yeah. Um, and then lastly, custom annotations. Uh, you're allowed to set stuff like timeouts, rate limiting, SSL configurations that are completely uh, invisible to the applications you're deploying. Um, and likewise, you can also use services like ingresses. We can actually see for OTN, I don't actually use an ingress. Instead, I just use a load balancer uh, that's selecting my service and it just runs. Lastly, we're gonna be talking about Helm. This is your package man manager for Kubernetes, or one of them at least, I think there's some more. Um, the one very specific uh, thing that you need to understand about Helm is Helm charts. You probably heard that term. This is just some kind of bundled resource to, to be deployed. Um, in terms of the basic commands that you can use for Helm, uh, Helm search repo, and then whatever you wanna say. So uh, for my uh, teleport cluster, it's actually all hosted in uh, Kubernetes, and I just use the, tel uh, the teleport chart for it. Um, so first I'd search Helm, Helm search repo teleport. It's, it filtered me about a, uh, back a bunch of re uh, search results, and then I can add the repo to my local machine and say, hey, this is something I wanna receive updates to. Helm repo update, it'll update all the repos that, you've current, uh, that you currently have added. Uh, Helm install, Helm will actually, or based on the context that you're currently deploying as, uh, it will deploy that chart to where you want. Um, Helm upgrade, and then the name in the chart. You can upgrade your repo, and then you can have it instantly upgrade your current deployment. Uh, and then lastly, Helm list, this will show you all your repos. Um, we can actually see for uh, my applications with or for teleport, um, I have uh, in, or an update script, so that any time that I wanna update my cluster, I literally just go in and copy this, uh, Helm update, teleport cluster, and then like a bunch of stuff. You can even define namespaces so that you don't even have to switch them. And then install, again, it's easy enough. And that will deploy you an entire server, or entire resource. So uh, some Kubernetes vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. Again, more security, we need to kinda hit some of this stuff. So uh, all the containerization vulnerabilities and misconfigurations still apply. All we're doing is abstracting it a little bit more, so as long as you can get a con uh, container escape, that can still mean that you're escaping onto your uh, bare metal cluster, or just wherever your cluster is hosted, and you have to deal with that. Um, some things to think about are static secrets, um, so secrets compiled into containers themselves. Likewise, uh, in all clusters, there's just specific directories that have all your secrets. Um, insecure etcd storage, so this is like unencrypted or uh, failure with access control. This is how containers can get resources at runtime. So uh, say you give some resource a certain, etcd is supposed to be so you can give uh, certain containers or pods, resources, services, whatever you want them, uh, you can give them certain certain access control types so that they can read uh, only the API or the, the information that they need, the secrets that they need. So imagine that you want your web application to have your WordPress API token, but you only want that one to have it. You can do that. And that was probably a bad example because I don't even know if WordPress has an API token. Um, exposed containers run, t uh, so exposing your containers when they should be behind, um, exposing your control plane. Realistically, you shouldn't have your entire Kubernetes uh, API publicly discoverable. Put that behind and then you have uh, either ingress controllers or load balancers that are public. Um, startup race conditions. There's actually a really cool demo, again, I saw at uh, DEF CON. Um, so Kubernetes, the big thing that Kubernetes wants to do is that if something comes down, it'll put it back up. Well, what if you know that something's gonna come down and instantly come back up? Well, you could uh, wait for that to happen. You can listen on the port that it's supposed to attach to, and because Kubernetes doesn't know uh, well enough, you can just uh, instantly take all that data in that it's trying to re-get back. Um, there's a bunch of cool applications there. Um, 
resource limits is also, uh, it can be both either the best thing that will protect you uh, for Kubernetes or it could also kill you. Um, so if you have just enormous resource limits, you can uh, result in like DOS attacks and uh, availability concerns. Likewise, whenever you, someone gets a shell on your box and is running in a full like PTY, that itself takes up a decent amount of resources. So what if you partition your resources so they can only handle say like a single user or maybe 10 users or whatever, but the, the moment that someone gets a PTY on there, that resource limits go beyond whatever you're using so that a Kubernetes will automatically take it down. It's kind of a patchwork solution, but it does happen. Um, and then lastly, poor network segmentation. If you're not using separate, separate namespaces, realistically, uh, Kubernetes should be uh, deployed such that even if you do g get uh, RCE on one of your containers, you shouldn't be able to pivot at all, you shouldn't be able to escape. So lastly, we're gonna do uh, a quick set of demos just talking about how to actually deploy to Kubernetes. I actually have this all published on my GitHub, um, but you guys, I don't think you guys have a cluster updated or cluster up right now, so we're just gonna do it on our own. Um, actually, it's one o'clock. Uh, okay, we'll try to do this quick. Okay, cool. Uh, let's start with actual Docker stuff. So I have this little application that where that all it's gonna do as soon as you access it, you, it's gonna tell you the host name of the container. Um, we're gonna see why this is important later, but we have this little container. How exactly do we make a Docker file for it? Um, if we can find it. Um, so I should have ChatGPT generated, so that's why it has comments. I don't comment my Docker containers normally, even though I should. But we're doing stuff like uh, creating a worker that's for our application. We're copying over requirements.txt. We're, um, what is it? We're installing all those requirements, we're copying our application over, we're exposing port 80 because that's what it's gonna be running on, and we're finally running it. Cool. Okay, now let's move to uh, the, our Docker Compose. Very similar and pretty much the same. We're building a container and exposing port 80. So, um, yeah. We actually need to go back a directory. So it runs, goes up, and I do not have access. I forgot to run sudo, so it's con complaining. Oh, port 80 is already allocated somehow. Um, oh yeah, my pie hole runs on port 80. Okay, we're just gonna ignore that port part, but it would work. I've, I guess I didn't test on this uh, machine. Um, cool. So we have some kind of container that works. How do we move forward? I actually have this whole little thing. We're gonna be uh, going through a bunch of little processes. We're gonna be kind of skipping around. First, um, let's just see that we actually have access to a cluster. Um, let's see if we can get our context. Or sorry, config and get context. We see that we have our context, that's my, uh, deploy or my production uh, environment and then I just have a little demo one for you guys. So we already have our demo context selected. So um, we're gonna move into our code deploy. And if we look at our pods, we can see um, we're deploying what is already here, our uh, demo, which actually in a little caveat I'll show you guys. Uh, I built CI CD for this so that it will automatically push to Docker Hub anytime that I update it. Um, this itself is cool and I have it up that you guys can just take a look. But within Docker, in order to build a Docker container, you first set up QMU, um, you uh, create a VM inside of QMU, you, cr you run Docker inside that, um, and then you're able to uh, build a container and export it. So this is what this is doing. So it's a bunch, a bunch of steps, but uh, it's pretty cool. Um, so our walkthrough. We have our pods.yaml. Bunch of deployment, we're gonna be deploying two replicas. So we're basically saying we're gonna be taking two of these templates. Okay, how do we apply those? Well, I kinda just told you the answer already. We apply. 
Um, so apply, TAC F, and we're gonna say we're applying pods. Uh, what if we look at our pods? Oh, well, they're starting up, they're getting. You can actually watch them, and well, just like that, we have two instances running. Um, what if we want to scale it out a little bit more? Uh, we can do config. Actually, I always forget this command. That's why I have documented. Oh, yeah. So, K, uh, edit, and we can say our deployment. Deployment are just our applications themselves. And what, what, are, applica or what are our deployments right now? We can see web app deployment. We get a little, um, this is far more verbose than what we deployed, but it's, just, it's essentially the same thing. Um, well, we had a spec of two here. What if we want 10 containers? And we say yes. Next. Um, okay, get pods. And we can see them spinning up all those. So right there, we went from a deploy of two to 10, and we can also shrink those deploys. And let's, let's meet in the middle and we'll do three. And just like that, we can actually see it terminating seven of the 10 con containers. Okay, cool. You can spin up, we can spin up containers that have no external networking and they just exist on the cluster. We can run them. Okay, so what are we gonna do next? Uh, so we're gonna build a service. And this is gonna be a node, node port service because I didn't deploy an ingress controller to this. So you guys will all actually be able to access this um, as well as I will. So let's look at the node ports. Um, actually, I forgot that I have it right here. So what does it look like? Deploying a service, we're calling it the web app service. Um, our selector for our selector is just gonna be a web app that relates to our pods. And we're saying that on our cluster, it's gonna be port 30,080. Cool. Okay. Um, K apply um, tech F and we're doing this file, the service node port. Okay. What if we wanna see our services? Oh, well, we K got the get service. It's already deployed. And if you actually check, you can curl, I think I called it demo.maxfusco uh, uh, port 30,080. And there we go. And you can actually see that it's automatically load balancing. We're, we're hitting different containers every single time. And you guys, if you want to, you can check it out yourself. Um, if I wanted to like spend a little bit more time, I can actually deploy or like move down to one and you'll see that it only ever hits one container because we only have one container running or we can deploy a hundred and we'll have a hundred containers running. We'll load balance across those. But I think you guys get the point. Okay. Next thing we're gonna be talking about are load balancers. Uh, load balancers, uh, we're deploying an external IP. So load balancers are completely based on whatever cloud provider that you're using. What Kubernetes will say is, hey, someone just deployed a load balancer, you should spin up a new box and we're gonna filter traffic through there. And it's like, cool, I'll automatically charge them some extra money a month and, we won't, and it'll just work. Um, so we actually have our service named the ex exact same as the node port, so we'll just overwrite the config. So if we do something like, hey, apply um, tech F service and we called it a load balancer. Okay, it's running, it's probably removing some stuff. It's, uh, what should we call it? Deploying some more resources. Oh, I'm able to connect to server. Interesting. Um, tell me that. <laughs> tell me I just killed my cluster. That sucks. Oh, no, never, never mind. It just wanted to be special. There we go, it's configured. Uh, this is a live demo, we couldn't have any, we couldn't have it any other way. So yeah, um, let's K get our service. Uh, and we have it running. And we also, we also have an external IP. 
because it automatically provisions a new box. So if we go to this one, run into here, and let's hope in a second, boom, we have a brand new IP that everything is running off of. Um, how do you actually, there we go. And you can see all the containers running because we're hitting different containers every time we run this. And you're probably asking, wow, this is probably pretty expensive. Oh, uh, yeah, because I, I think the node balancers will node are like $10 a month. So let's remove it. Um, get, I think it's uh, K delete, yeah, delete. Oh, that's a lot of things that just came out. Um, and we want service, and we can see that our web service, and we can just delete it, and everything comes back down. Well, let's also delete our pods, because we probably shouldn't be using uh, resources that we don't need. And I forgot that it is not a service, and instead it is a deployment. Okay, cool. And I probably named it something different, web app deployment, there we go, and it's deleted. And if we K get the pods, uh, it's terminating everything because we turned it down. And just like that, we deployed stuff. We got external IPs. We, uh, I, what, what do we end up deploying? Like 14 box, or 14 containers all in a matter of under 10 minutes. Um, yeah, that's Kubernetes in a nutshell. There's far more to learn. Uh, but again, this is an intro presentation. And this is a start off for your learning. And I forgot to add a question slide. So questions. What's up? Yep. Yeah, so imagine, um, like to talk about, what, what's a, say you're running a production environment and, I don't know, you're running your API, but your API needs access to another backend API that maybe is not hosted, or, yeah. Uh, but it needs access to some other resource that needs like an API token, it needs credentials, it needs something else. Well, you're not gonna compile that directly into the uh, container itself. So you can create a Kubernetes secret. And so that at runtime, it can automatically uh, pull that secret. And then updating that secret is an, as easy as just updating the secret instead of having to remake containers. And then when you're, say, inevitably your container registry, uh, someone accidentally pushes to Docker Hub. Okay, well, no secrets are in there because all our secrets are handled by kubectl. Or sorry, not kubectl, Kubernetes. Um, other questions? I know that was dense. And if, you're, if you want to ask me to be like, speak English, I, I will. Okay. Sound, oh. I've got nothing witty for this. You never have anything witty. Yeah, I'd guess it isn't here. What? I don't know, a token. Uh, a little a token, perhaps a, a challenge coin. That is 25 bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Um, yeah, that's about it. For, you, for those of you who don't know, I'm officially the third person in RIT Sec history to get that, which is very exciting. <laughs> See y'all. Everybody give, oh God, that's loud. Everyone give uh, Max a round of applause, dude. That's like hard to do. Yeah. I believe people in this room can also get that accomplishment, you know, there's a lot of you first and second years in here that could be giving research presentations on very good topics and things you guys are interested in. Um, you guys should do it. It's not as scary as you think it is. It's real fun. You get to share your knowledge, and that's the whole point of the club, right? It's to share. Security through community, woo! Uh, but anyway, um, it's demo time now, and Okay, yeah. Uh, the demos exist. They were curated by a long lineage of tech leads, and you guys should do them. <laughs>